As the sun rose on July 2, 1863, the air was thick with tension and the promise of conflict over the rolling hills of Gettysburg. What would unfold that day would not only shape the course of the Civil War, but also expose the deep fractures within both the Union and Confederate commands. In a battle marked by bravery and sacrifice, it was not just the enemy's fire that threatened to unravel their efforts. It was the infighting and miscalculations among their own leaders that would prove equally perilous. General George Gordon Meade's Army of the Potomac had fortified its position, yet doubts loomed large among his officers. Meanwhile, General Robert E. Lee, riding high on a wave of previous victories, was determined to crush the Union forces. However, beneath the surface of Lee's audacious strategy lay a growing discord. The reluctance of James Longstreet to follow Lee's orders foreshadowed a day fraught with missed opportunities and critical errors. As artillery began to roar and chaos erupted across the battlefield, decisions made in the heat of battle would reveal shocking truths about leadership under pressure. This gripping narrative delves into the untold story of infighting and incompetence that plagued both sides during one of history's most pivotal clashes. Join us as we uncover how these internal struggles not only influenced the outcome of Gettysburg, but also left an indelible mark on American history itself. But before we begin, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel to support our community. It is Thursday, July 2nd, 1863, in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. During the night, General George Gordon Meade and his Army of the Potomac set up a strong defensive position on the hills south of Gettysburg. This position starts at Culp's Hill, extends across Cemetery Ridge, and ends at Little and Big Round Top. These heights control key roads that allow Meade to connect with Washington, D.C. and receive much needed reinforcements and supplies. As long as his officers follow orders without hesitation, Meade is in a very strong spot. On the opposite side, Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia are positioned along Cemetery Ridge, directly across from the Union troops. After successfully taking Gettysburg and defeating two federal corps the previous day, Lee aims to destroy the Federal Army today. His straightforward plan involves attacking from the south with Longstreet's Corps, while Ewell strikes from the north, with Hill's Corps providing support for both attacks. Lee intends to overwhelm the Federal forces and collapse their entire army. However, James Longstreet disagrees with this plan. He and his scouts have carefully assessed Meade's strength and recognized the significant importance of those roads for both sides. On July 2nd, as dawn breaks over the battlefield, additional Union troops arrive from Maryland to bolster their numbers. Longstreet's own forces are not at full strength. He has only two of his three divisions available and lacks confidence for an attack without all his men present. Despite Longstreet's concerns about launching an assault, General Lee instructs A.P. Hill to send General Richard Anderson's division to aid Longstreet's planned attack. Longstreet reluctantly consents, but waits for one last brigade before launching an attack on the Union lines. Meanwhile, Union troops remain prepared for any Southern movements or attacks that might come their way, except for one division that stands ready for action. General Daniel Sickles felt uneasy about his position during the Battle of Gettysburg. He was worried as he looked at the sloping field ahead, recalling how the Confederates had used higher ground against him at Chancellorsville. According to General Meade's orders, Sickles was supposed to hold the Union line on Little and Big Round Top, but instead he moved his troops forward a few yards toward the Emmitsburg Road. This split his division, sending some men to a rocky position on the left called Devil's Den, while others advanced along the road, creating a gap between the Union's Second and Third Corps and leaving their left flank vulnerable. By 4 p.m., Longstreet's Corps was finally ready to attack, but noticed Sickles' troops were further ahead than planned. John Bell Hood, one of Longstreet's division commanders, suggested they swing right and attack Sickles from behind. 
However, Longstreet decided he could not deviate from Lee's overall plan and denied this suggestion. At 4 p.m., hours delayed, Confederate artillery began bombarding the Federal left flank. As the cannon fire erupted on the left, Meade was inspecting Union lines and became increasingly concerned about what he saw. He directed his chief engineer, Governor Warren, saying, Warren, I hear some cannon fire in the direction of that little hill over there. I wish you would ride over and check it out. If anything serious is happening, please attend to it. Warren saluted dutifully and rode toward Little Round Top, where he became the first senior general to realize what Sickles had done. Climbing to the top of the hill, Warren found only a small detachment from the Signal Corps there. Most of the Third Corps had moved away from this critical position. Taking out his binoculars, he observed Sickles' men being struck by rebel artillery and noticed two other significant developments. He could see a division of Lafayette McClaws staging for an attack at Sickles' front and another division moving in from the north. More importantly, he spotted in the woods to his left something reflecting in the sunlight. After looking closer, he figured out what it was. Hood's division was preparing to commit their assault, which now made it easier to surprise Sickles' troops with their forward position. Before contacting Meade about this urgent situation, Warren quickly acted by requesting reinforcements. General Sykes and the Fifth Corps were already coming up the Taney Town Road, and Colonel Strong Vincent's brigade was ready to move up to Little Round Top. Meanwhile, back at the front of Little Round Top, Hood began his attack, advancing out of the woods toward the highly depleted Union left flank. Leading this fierce attack was Robertson's famous Texas Brigade moving toward Devil's Den, only to be shocked by pockets of Bernie's men who were now defending fiercely. Hood himself would be wounded when an artillery shell exploded nearby, severely injuring him and forcing him off the field. At this point in time, one of Meade's staff members Ironically, his son, Captain George Meade, was informed about the Third Corps' new position and quickly informed his father about what was occurring on the battlefield. Robertson slammed into Devil's Den with great force, pushing back Bernie's men and chasing them through rocky terrain, which caused even more chaos in the fighting. As Devil's Den fell under Confederate control, McLaws' attack finally began against what remained of Sickles' Third Corps. To Robertson's right was General Evander Law's Alabama Brigade with their objective set on taking control of both round tops. The Texans had momentarily halted after taking Devil's Den as they observed both hills before them and assessed their next move across the valley toward Little Round Top. This land will be remembered as the Valley of Death. Back on Little Round Top, General Warren had Colonel Vincent's brigade position itself as follows. On the far left of the Union Army was the 20th Maine, to their right was the 83rd Pennsylvania, then the 44th New York, capped off by the 16th Michigan, with additional units falling into their right. Warren also called for the 140th New York from the 5th Corps, commanded by Colonel Patty O'Rourke, who helped Warren get an artillery battery to the top of the hill. As the regiment crested the hill, they saw Confederates advancing from the Valley of Death. The other Federals began firing on this unusual wave of troops. O'Rourke jumped in front of his men and shouted, Down this way, boys, in an attempt to organize his troops. Once organized, he commanded them, Here they are, men, commence firing. Moments later, O'Rourke was shot in the neck and collapsed, but his regiment held firm as the rest of the 5th Corps rushed into battle to help reinforce the Union lines. The scene at Little Round Top was descending into chaos. General Warren was also shot, nearly killing him, and Hazlitt, the commander of the artillery battery, was killed as well. Colonel Vincent realized the chaotic situation as he now had men from the 5th, 3rd, and even more confused 2nd Corps in his ranks. He did his best to control things. Proudly, he jumped on a large boulder, waving his riding whip and yelling to all his men under command, don't give them an inch. He would be shot in his groin while doing this and died a few days later. 
Meanwhile, Law's Alabamians were moving up into the gap between the Round Tops toward the Federal flank, where Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine awaited them. Six times Alabamians attacked and were repulsed by Chamberlain's men who were ordered to hold at all costs by General Warren and Colonel Vincent, both now wounded and removed from action. Colonel Chamberlain knew his regiment could not sustain a seventh attack. Thus, he decided that preparing for hand-to-hand -hand combat while pushing back the Southerners off the hill was essential. He ordered his men to fix bayonets as the Alabamians launched their final assault. Chamberlain led a charge down the slope with the 20th Maine, pushing Law's men off Little Round Top and securing it for that day. Hood's attack ended with a withdrawal of his Alabamians as Law, now in command of that division, was unsure how much more could be accomplished with troops from the 5th, 6th, and 12th Corps moving into position to fight. Of Lee's plan, only Devil's Den was taken. Another veteran division commander was wounded on the Confederate side, while General Warren was injured on the Union side. Meade rode furiously to Sickles. These two men had little regard for each other. Sickles viewed Meade as a West Point fool like many other West Point officers, while Meade openly referred to Sickles as a murderer. Sickles had killed his wife's lover, the district attorney of Washington, D.C., who was also Philip Barton Key's son, author of The Star-Spangled Banner. This incident happened near the White House in Washington, D.C., where Sickles got acquitted for temporary insanity, the first case of its kind. When Meade arrived at the scene, they began to argue violently. Meade yelled at Sickles, while Sickles sarcastically asked if he wanted him to withdraw. As they argued, McLaws' brigades under Kershaw struck into the gap between Bernie's split division. This made Meade realize how serious their situation now was. The Third Corps was engaged on all fronts as Kershaw, supported by Hood's brigades under Benning, moved toward a large wheat field. Meade stopped thinking about saving Sickles' Third Corps. Instead, he needed to restore Union lines and delay Confederate forces long enough for his entire army to restructure. His first step was contacting his most trusted lieutenant, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock in the 2nd Corps, one of the most experienced corps in their army. Without hesitation, he ordered Hancock to move a division to support Sickles' 3rd Corps, but more importantly, delay McClaws' attack long enough for reinforcements to arrive. By 5.30 p.m., Kershaw had split Bernie from his men in the south. Now, General Humphrey's men were being attacked at Peach Orchard. General William Barksdale and his Mississippi Brigade began slamming into Sickles' salient, while Humphrey's division spread out, slowly deteriorated under pressure. The Third Corps' lines were so thin that General Sickles had artillery placed in line with infantry to stretch them out as he would also become a casualty during the fighting. When he rode to a knoll for a better view, a 12-pound solid shot from the Confederates ricocheted off the ground, hitting him in the leg and twisting it almost 360 degrees. Two stories exist about this incident. The first states that Sickles fell from his horse and was carried off the battlefield, calmly smoking a cigar as his corps collapsed around him. The second, likely more accurate, recounts that he fell from his horse while screaming in pain all the way off the field. General Burney was then put in command of the Third Corps, but he was leading a sinking ship as the Corps was collapsing in every direction. All he could do at this point was protect his depleting position. Hancock was directed to send a division to support the fighting, commanded by General John Caldwell. Under his command, were the brigades of General Samuel Zook, Colonel Edward Cross, John Brooke, and Patrick Kelly, with Colonel Kelly leading the famous Irish Brigade. As the brigade marched towards Sickles' salient, they were halted. The chaplain of the 88th New York and later president of Notre Dame University, Father William Corby, stopped the entire brigade. 
The brigade and nearby Catholic soldiers gathered around Father Corby, who climbed onto a rock as artillery and bullets whizzed by and gave the final sacrament of absolution so their earthly sins could be forgiven. As he finished, he cheered out to his soldiers, Now go get him, my fighting Irish! Caldwell and his division arrived at the staging area. The remaining parts of the Third Corps were protecting them as they deployed into this weak field. At this point, Bernie's division was in shambles while Humphrey's division was barely holding on as more Confederates attacked. The division pushed into the weak field and successfully pushed out General Anderson's brigade, actually gaining ground. However, when Humphrey's division finally collapsed, McLaw's division began to close in on Caldwell's division, which was becoming surrounded. While this was taking place, the 5th and 12th Corps were being sent onto the field. Meade was restructuring his position as the 3rd Corps scattered across the front. Hancock faced his own issues as General Richard Anderson's Confederate division moved in on McLaw's left flank to support the fighting and could not assist Caldwell, who was becoming surrounded. After a long fight, the division finally collapsed after being surrounded on three sides and withdrew toward the Tannytown Road. However, the Confederate front now formed a straight line facing off against a restructured and reinforced Union line around 7 o'clock as Hood's division began its assault on Little Round Top. Anderson and McLaws also attempted their attack. Anderson, who was aiding Longstreet's offensive, sent one brigade to exploit a significantly weakened gap between the 2nd and 3rd Corps where only a single regiment remained. General Hancock rode up to the regiment and asked, What regiment is this? Colonel William Caldwell responded, First Minnesota, sir. Hancock pointed out the Confederate brigade commanded by General Cadmus Wilcox and ordered them to attack that line. The First Minnesota, numbering only 250 men, charged Wilcox's brigade of 1,726 men delaying them long enough for General Willard's brigade to support and ultimately stop Wilcox's advance. Simultaneously, Anderson sent Wright's division to attack the western slope of Cemetery Ridge. However, they were repulsed by the men of the 2nd and 1st Corps who awaited their arrival. As night fell over the battlefield, Longstreet finally called off all attacks. The Confederates had gained very little in the South they captured Devil's Den, but then slammed into the newly formed Federal line. Meade's defensive position had worked effectively. He managed to hold his left flank and importantly secured both the Tannytown Road and the Baltimore Pike. Lee was in shock at this unexpected failure and would have to devise one last desperate plan of attack while praying that the thousands of casualties would ultimately be worth it in the end. As the sun set over the blood-soaked fields of Gettysburg, the echoes of gunfire faded into an unsettling silence, leaving behind a landscape forever altered by conflict. The Union forces had held their ground against the Confederate onslaught, but at a staggering cost, thousands of lives lost and heroes forged in the crucible of war. Yet beneath this hard-won victory lay a troubling truth. Infighting and miscalculations among commanders nearly derailed their efforts. What if James Longstreet had followed his instincts or if General Sickles had adhered to orders? The decisions made that day not only shaped the outcome at Gettysburg, but also reverberated through history, influencing the very fabric of a nation at war with itself. As we reflect on this tumultuous chapter, we are left to ponder how might history have changed if unity and clarity had prevailed? What untold stories of bravery and blunders remain hidden in the shadows? The Battle of Gettysburg was not just a clash of armies. It exposed the complexities of leadership and human fallibility. What lessons can we glean from this struggle that still resonate today? Share your thoughts below and continue the conversation about how these monumental moments shape our understanding of courage and conflict in history.